Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Max Price. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this forum on behalf of the University of Cape Town, which is hosting it, uh, together with the Mail and Guardian. And welcome to Nick Dawes, the editor, and the Ambassador of Germany, Dr. Horst Freitag. Uh, con welcome to this co hosted event. I want to also just introduce to you uh, our panelists. Uh, convening the panel is Mr. Eusebius MacKaiser on my right, and going around, uh, Professor Ben Chirak of the African National Congress, uh, not actually in the order I have here, um, <laughs> the former Minister of Germany uh, of Justice and someone who's been involved, she asked us to correct the uh, blurb in the program because her real claim to being here is the extent to which she's involved in mediation and uh, resolving of, of labor disputes and conflicts in Germany over many years. Um, uh, Dr. Hertha Dablik Mellen of the German Social Democratic Party. Uh, next to her is uh, Mr. Michael Spicer of Business Leadership South Africa, also has been for many years a member of NEDLAC, one of the key structures that has uh, attempted to address the relationships between uh, labor, business, and government. Um, then uh, Mr. Sej Motau, who is uh, from the Democratic Alliance uh, and is the Shadow Minister of Labor, uh, also has a distinguished uh, record of uh, service, but asked me to highlight as well the fact that in the program he is listed as a past chairman of Anglo-American and a number of other companies, whereas he claims he worked for them uh, rather than ran them. <laughs> so just to be clear... Tony Ehrenreich, today representing Kasatu, uh, certainly a very well-known figure, also uh, a member of NEDLAC and uh, a key campaigner over decades for workers' rights and uh, the strength, gr growing strength of unions. The University of Cape Town has certainly uh, many reasons to be excited about a forum like this being held here, aside from the opportunity to expose students and staff and members of the public to a very topical debate, uh, clearly a time when many of us have a sense that the labor relations are in crisis following the Marikana uh, massacre, following the uh, Winelands and uh, Western Cape farm strikes, <coughs> but also because as an intellectual project, the university takes these issues of employment, uh, labor policy, industrialization policy, economic development very seriously. Some of you will know we have a major project called the Poverty and Inequality Initiative. One element of that was the Carnegie Three Conference on Poverty and Inequality in September last year, which is an ongoing project. We have people working in projects such as the Institute for Development and Labor Law, uh, recently hosted a conference called Capturing the Gains, uh, which is looking at how the value chain in a globalized world which transfers value add across different countries can be better captured and ensure that it doesn't simply lead to exploitation uh, around the world. Uh, we have a project um, called the Employment Promotion Program, uh, which is now going into its second phase. We have uh, in the Center for Social Sciences and also uh, in the uh, Department of Sociology, we have a number of experts who in the last two or three weeks have been giving expert evidence on opposite sides of the Newcastle court case, some arguing, economists arguing that uh, standard wages across the country uh, cannot, be, uh, cannot be tolerated, that that's going to cause, uh, that's going to compromise employment, and others arguing uh, the opposite case that the bargaining councils would be destroyed if you allowed, um, if you allowed uh, what is happening in Newcastle. So within the university, we have a very active debate around these issues. And so for all these reasons, uh, it's uh, appropriate to uh, be hosting this here, and thank you for the opportunity for doing so. Welcome to all of you. My name is Eusebius MacKaiser. I'm going to be the moderator of the debate. And um, I want to explain in a second uh, what the process will be. But uh, from my side as well, thanks to all of you who have taken time out to, to come to this event and to engage on a very important issue. I'm glad that you deemed us more important than watching the latest in Oscar's Pistorius saga or more news on Dr. Rampella's, Rampella's um, 
new political party. I notice that we've got six panelists here. We could start a party as well called a gang of six <laughs> to match the a gang of five that was established today. So this topic is an incredibly important one, and I'm going to make a couple of remarks and then um, give you what the process will be this evening. We're going to keep it very dynamic, as much audience participation as possible. I'm going to start off by prompting my panelists with questions, so they're not going to make long-winded speeches. So hopefully it will be both entertaining, but also we can drill down to some of the issues. But before I do that, um, I think I'd like to give a chance to the German ambassador, Dr. Horst Freitag, just to say a couple of words. Thank you so much. First of all, Honorable uh, Dr. Max Preuss, uh, Vice, -Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of this uh, fine and splendid institution called University of Cape Town, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Mail and Guardian, Nick Dawes, political analyst, talk show host and author, Eusebius McKaiser, um, who we have the good fortune to welcome as a moderator today, esteemed panelists who have been introduced and distinguished guests from all walks of life, let me just say that it is an, it's a great pleasure to be here. It is always good to be at the UT, UCT. And I would like to thank the Vice Chancellor, Max Price, for his generous, generous hospitality in hosting us tonight. Um, also, credit and gratitude goes to the staff of the Mail and Guardian um, for so well organizing and setting up this uh, criti critical thinking forum. Um, and this is what it's going to be. Um, as I'm a non English native speaker, let me emphasize critical thinking forum. We do not intend to turn this into a sinking forum, uh, neither in a conduct a uh, singing forum. And um, I just hope we stick where we are, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, also, from our point of view, we'd like, you know, it's been a great pleasure and privilege to work together with such renowned institutions and representatives. Thank you for being such a, such a uh, great partner. In his book, and I'd like to just take that one up, a Bantu in my bathroom. Eusebius McKaiser collected a number of essays on race, sexuality, and other uncomfortable South African truths and topics. And I believe we all agree tonight that the ongoing labor disputes, I, dispute is certainly such a topic. Um, it is also a topic which is not and by no means uniquely or exclusively South African. We, and when I say we, I mean Germany or other member states, and I could replace those with any uh, other country of your choice. We all are facing and will be facing labor disputes, um, the intended and unintended consequences, and surely also the uncomfortable consequences. So balancing the dynamic economic growth against the stability, against the Unity and the social cohesion of our societies is perhaps today the most pressing challenge of any free state in a globalized world. Uh, simply put, how do we define and how do we balance in freedom and responsibility individually and collectively? Uh, this forum will take a hard look, and I'm looking forward to this, but also provide some stimulating ideas and best practices to help turn challenges into opportunities. And it is in this encouraging spirit of which, by the way, I have found plenty here in South Africa, uh, despite the inherited rifts that you have, it is in this encouraging spirit that I now hand over to Eusebius McKaiser. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks, including your kind reference to my book, German Engineering, where you need it most in a PR officer. So your check will be in the post. I want to start this conversation just by framing what the interest was uh, behind this collaboration and why we thought it's worthwhile having a critical forum around this. We, we seem to have a lot of violent strikes. We seem to have a lot of labor disputes in South Africa. We had Marikana last year, which, uh, contrary to the National Press Club, was probably the most important news event in the country. And it begs several questions. Is there a problem in the relationship between business, labor, and government it's not clear that everyone has the same answer. President Jacob Zuma, for example, pushed back in an interview on CNBC Africa yesterday with Karima Brown when she put it to him that, in fact, there's a widening rift between these stakeholders, and he said, no, there isn't a problem. So we really want to have a broad conversation this evening, diagnosing whether there's a problem in that relationship between the stakeholders, what is the nature of that problem and its magnitude, and then, of course, to puzzle out 
How does one fix the processes and the mechanisms? And perhaps most importantly, actually, towards the end of the hour, asking, aren't there real elephant in the room that have nothing to do with processes? Deep, deep disagreement on key questions like income inequality and like the state of a labor legislation in South Africa. Because sometimes one can talk about the mechanisms to avoid substantive disagreement on the real issues uh, that people will disagree on, even if you had perfect mechanisms for dialogue. So it's going to be a very broad-ranging conversation. We'll start with a discussion between the panelists, and there will be two rounds of questions uh, with the audience. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep it very dynamic and just uh, see how it plays out over the next hour or so. I want to start with you, Michael, and ask exactly that question. In terms of the general relationship between business, labor, and government, what is the state of that particular relationship, and do you, do you buy the casual pushback from the president yesterday in that very important interview where he dismissed the idea that there's a massive problem, but at the very least, if there is a problem, he was clear that the problem is not worse than it was before. Mm. Thanks very much, Eusebius. <clears throat> Let me make four points. Firstly, I think um, the relationship between these parties is burdened by the legacy of the past. We have to remember this is South Africa, and the past counts, matters of race count. Secondly, it would be strange were the differing interests of business, labor, and government not to make a difference. And thirdly, we must be aware that we have widely differing assumptions about the nature of economies, how they grow, the correct weighting to accord to growth and equity. This is a universal debate around the world and also the waiting to accord to poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Mm. As a business person, I would wait more to growth. I know some of my colleagues here would wait more to equality. I would put more emphasis on generation of new resources rather than distribution of the existing pie. So that's my first main point. Second point, business and government under the Zuma administration did not talk for two years. When they began to talk, it was not on the, uh, the, the way we had under the uh, Mbeki administration, a structured agenda, programmatic. That has begun now, but just to illustrate how we are talking past each other, I think it is in the mind of the President and others, now that the nationalization debate has, so to speak, been put to bed, the problem is over. But as far as the mining industry is concerned, there is as much, if not more, uncertainty now with the uh, changes proposed to the mining legislation, proposes change, uh, to, uh, ch changes proposed to taxes and so on and so forth. Thirdly, the institutions need some re-examination. NEDLAC, the uh, uh, tripartite institution for social dialogue, uh, really has become a forum for distributional bargaining. And it's a classic corporatist carver to, between the insiders, big business, big labor, and I'm critical of business as well as the other parties here, and big government, reach agreements that suit them but are not necessarily in the national interest. And certainly NEDLAC makes very little provision for the unemployed, a growing number of people in South Africa. It focuses on those who are inside the tent. Business is inside the tent, government inside the tent, and labor inside the tent. We have a bilateral uh, institution, the Millennium Labor Council for Business and Labor. That really, frankly, uh, we have nice dinners, but we don't get to grips with the uh, matters. Finally, the best analysis, naturally published in the Mail and Guardian, of Marikana by Gavin Hartford, I think dissects with a scalpel the failings of all the parties. And the, the point is very clear. All parties failed and are failing and need to look to their laurels. From the business perspective, what he pointed out is that we have outsourced relations with employees to the unions. We have failed to push the need for productivity in the collective bargaining and make this part of the accord on wages. And that is why South Africa is slipping down the competitiveness leagues. Uh, so there's a lot that business needs to do. I won't uh, dwell on the other matters. So yes, there is a problem. It's moot as to whether it's, it's worse than before, but it's a big problem, uh, and we need to address it. Well, I mean, I do want to push you on the, on the last bit. We'll, we'll, we'll get to some of the 
four issues that you've mentioned, such as the limitations of NEDLAC, whether we should chuck it out, think of a new forum. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and, and I think many of us might agree with you on some of the substantive issues you put on the table. But a simple question. As a businessman, do you feel now that you can speak your mind frankly on the important questions of the day when you engage government, when you engage labor? Uh, do you feel you can do so? And to what extent do you feel uh, you can do so now with a degree of ease that perhaps wasn't there before? Uh, because the public is interested to know what that relationship is in terms of its trajectory. Do you find Zuma more approachable, for example, than, say, the Mbeki years? I don't think um, it's much worse, but that is to say that it's never been much good. Uh, <laughs> and the fault lies on both sides. I'm very critical of myself and my business colleagues because I think that we have allowed ourselves to become captive to political correctness and to be too servile. Uh, and I think business, uh, we, we had that wonderful phrase, dunk de minister, you know, the sort of patsy uh, um, interview on the SABC under the old regime. I think when business and government get together, many business people become far too soft and they don't say what's in their mind. Why not? Equally, however, equally, however on the few occasions that they do, they are uh, roundly assassinated by by government, their feet are cut off. I happen to be personally involved mm. in some of the major instances of that in the early 2000s. So for all the saying, uh, and Trevor Manuel and others are very low, uh, prone to saying, oh, come on, tell us what's on your mind. Be frank. The moment you're frank, you, you're told this is completely unacceptable. You can't possibly have those thoughts. Um, please get right. Think right. OK. Um, <laughs> or think left, and you might think be heard. Left. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Professor Turok, you chuckled there. I suspect it was a chuckle of disagreement. Well, partly. Um, but I want to go back to your, origi your original question. Is there a problem between business, labor, and the government? And is President Zuma correct? Now, I'm a member of the ANC, so I'm going to be very polite in the way I address that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I think he's partly right and partly wrong. He is perhaps right. We have to separate the form of these relations from the content. And that's the essence of this whole debate, it seems to me. Mm. Because the form, tea parties, lachotlas, the recent meeting between business and President Zuma, and of course, and Becky did it regularly, he invited all the business people, including Mike Spicer, to, uh, to the cabinet room, no less, and they had tea and listened to Trevor Manuel for a few hours. And, and, uh, and that was it. So the form of the relationship seemed on the surface to be fine. But the content is another matter. And the content, it seems to me, we have to go much deeper into the history of South Africa and say, this is a society based on conflict. It's a society in which the state organized, coercive, cheap labor, migrant labor, the Marikana thing is the symptom of it all, and given that history, can we have a form which addresses the content, namely the history? And I would say it's not easy. I would say nobody in this room, would, nobody in government or the ANC, would deny that we have to do much better in the relationship between business, labor, and government. Clearly, things are not moving as well as they should be, and no amount of tea parties in the cabinet office or anywhere else is going to fix it. There is a fundamental dialogue that must take place. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to do it here. But we must remember that South Africa, this South Africa that we're sitting in is rooted in a terrible history of coercion, of cheap labor, of oppression, and so on. And a lot of that legacy is still with us. So now to say, <clears throat> is there a magic wand which can produce decent relationships, good relationships, between government, labor, and business. Well, it's uphill. Unfortunately, I think none of the three parties are making sufficient efforts. As I say, tokenism and nominal good practice and good, good tea parties won't do it. It is a very serious business which has to be addressed and very urgent. Let me also just finally say on that score, unfortunately, when we negotiated the settlement in 1992-94, a lot of discussion took place about the political arrangements. 
majority rule, whether the ANC would win the elections and so on. A great deal of discussion around constitutional legal rights, even civil liberties and all that. Very little discussion about the hardcore economic issues. And any text you read about those negotiations will show you that what was uppermost in the minds of the two protagonists, the National Party and the ANC, was what kind of political dispensation would emerge and how are we going to manage that in a peaceful transition, the rainbow nation. What was not discussed was the very fundamental issue we're addressing here, which is the economic and the labor relations. That was not addressed. But I, w I just want to stop you there, Professor. I mean, you, the for, what you call the form problem is not insignificant, and surely the ANC as a ruling party needs to take some flack there. You know, if FNB gets frog marched to Lutuli House, not even to Pretoria, but downtown Joburg, uh, notwithstanding the separation there between party and state not being respected, but there's also a chilling effect, and what Michael is being coy about is that when you know you might be threatened in the way in which FNB was threatened with potential opportunity to work within the state uh, being cut off, then the form problem is not a deep historical problem. It's a bunch of people who can't adapt to the liberative democracy called, you know, uh, the Lutuli House. So are you willing to also acknowledge that the ANC directly is part of what you call the form problem? Let, let me say on record, the ANC does make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, is this one of them? <laughs> is the way, is the way where they handle FNB you one know, of those mistakes? And the government makes mistakes. Let me concede that immediately. Whether this is a mistake or not, we can discuss. Let's clearly, do you think it is? <laughs> clearly, clearly, megaphone, megaphone, and what somebody called vuvuzela politics. Uh, there's no place for that in South Africa, really. And if anybody r raised their voice and used bad language and so on, in this very sensitive period, that's clearly a mistake. So, yes, I agree. People make mistakes, people use wrong nuances, wrong expressions and so on. But you know, we're all grown up and the, the structures of the society must not depend on whether X, some leading member of the ANC uses bad language. You know, we've all lived through mal Malema. Let's learn the lesson. You know, here was a cowboy who was treated like a god, not only by the ANC, but by the press, by the media. You know, he became a god in South Africa. And look at it, a scoundrel of the first order. And the fact, the fact that he was allowed to get away with what he did was a huge mistake. So we make mistakes, the ANC makes mistakes, government makes mistakes. Let's not dwell on the mistakes. Let's rather look forward to see how can we, how can these terrible structural difficulties we have, how can they be fixed? Not so quick, I'm afraid, Professor, because you can't talk about moving forward unless you have the right diagnosis of what's wrong in the status quo. So it's all great to sound aspirational about the importance of a social compact moving forward, but we need to be on the same page in this building about where the problems lie in the status quo. And if what you call intellectually a form problem amounts to something very simple and practical, an ANC le senior leader not being acculturated into frank and open disagreement with business, then it seems to me that is something that the ANC needs to take stock of and ask itself, how will we actually you know, acculturate ourselves to be able to speak to Michael openly and frankly without having a chilling effect on him by reminding well, him that we can also take away tenders well, potentially? Please take account of the fact that the gentleman you're talking, or the comrade that you're talking about, was a coal-faced mine worker. <laughs> he didn't get educated at UCT. He didn't do a course in sociology here and was trained to speak politely. This is a coal-faced mine worker who is now the Secretary General of the ANC. And he speaks in the way that workers speak. And that's, there's a place for that. You know, we don't all want to be diplomats and talk sweetly to each other. There is a room for a little bit of, of aggro, let's call it. So, but let's not get hooked on individual incidents, because this is our problem, you see. We're not the media here. We're supposed to be analyzing intellectually. So let's not get caught in incidents or personalities. They are far too important issues Se around Sedge is us. dying there to, to, to no, come in. Actually, I, I just wanted to do something very quickly, um, just to show how important this discussion is at this time. Uh, I know Eusebius doesn't like it when we throw numbers at him, but uh, if you think about it, we have about 18 million people who are supposed to be in our workforce. Okay? We have 11 million of them who are supposed to be working. 
We have about 7 million of them who are not working. We have about 3 million of them who are young people who don't work. We have about 2 million who are not, uh, who have given up looking for work. Now, the importance of this thing is that we've got to find that, that glue that will get business, labor, and government working and talking. I mean, what Mike said earlier on, for two years, you know, government wasn't speaking to, 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 um, uh, to business in a manner that you would expect. So my, 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 my view is that we actually need to go to the heart of why they're not talking and why when they talk, nothing comes out. I have, my own feeling is that there is a breakdown of, in trust. There's no trust. Um, so um, the, 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 the social partners come in and, and I think Ben touched on it. They are all sort of nice to one another and they walk out. We've got to get beyond the niceties. Uh, the hour is late. We need to find a way in which we can get those seven million people back to work. And we're not going to get it unless we start building. No, <coughs> acknowledging that there is a breakdown in trust, doing something about building the trust so that when we reach agreements and we can talk about NEDLEC later on, those can be binding. That, that's really what I think we what's, need to be What's doing. your analysis of why there is a lack of trust right. such that it has the impact that people don't speak frankly? Indeed. Um, uh, just a quick one. I, 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 I did some research when I was preparing for this thing, and I want to quote you one of the um, civil society uh, 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 partners at NEDLEC, and this is, this is what he said. He said, sometimes I get the feeling distinctly uh, depressing that if South Africa did not have any poor or unemployed people, these people, these people, uh, and I think he meant government, labor, business, would invent them just so that they can claim that they are the champions of the poor and the unemployed. Now, you see, <laughs> the, these are some of the things that, in my view, um, go to the heart of the problem. People have lost faith. They, they, they think that they're just going through the motions, and so something is needed, and I hope that here tonight we can maybe start building the rudiments of that thing, that trust. Um, the desperation that I feel is that we, we need urgent solutions to address the issue, especially that I touched on, the labor thing. We do need that, Seth, yes. but I, I mean, I, I want to pressurize you to, to do some analysis on why the problem exists and what its nature okay. is, rather than just being aspirational about wanting everyone to get along yeah. and speak frankly. I think we can all articulate yeah. what the ideal dialogical space should be in society. After all, we've chosen right. a model of democracy that's deliberative and participatory. Yeah. So it's an easy political win to, to, to paint a picture of where we'd like to be. What is a DA analysis of why that lack of trust exists in the room? Well, here, here's, here's something that I can, I can use for you to, to get this um, thing. And it's again one of those things that um, the, the, it goes back to trust. It's about... Um, Labor, for instance, feeling that um, business is there just to exploit the workers, just to get cheap labor, just to get as rich as possible, as quickly as possible. On the other hand, we have had uh, government saying um, some businesses are unpatriotic. Now, we talked earlier about language. It's a very, very important thing how people say things. When, when somebody in government or, or says to me, I am unpatriotic, it's not the same as my friend saying I'm unpatriotic. It's a very serious uh, thing. And so we, I, we believe that these things need to be discussed. And the only way we can discuss them is to have a situation where we can have the social partners locked in a room and be frank indeed, as Mike Spicer said earlier, with one another and say, what is the problem? Okay, so let's talk about some of the options then. Yeah. Um, we'll look at Germany in, in a second and see what yeah. lessons we can learn there. But Tony, you've had experience. We say that partners to this dialogue should be able to sit as adults and hammer out the substantive disagreements. I thought that's the point of NEDLEC. Why is NEDLEC not exactly that? Well, I think you're right when you say the issue is not whether we're talking and how we're talking. It's what we're talking about. Even our conversation here tonight, we don't for a moment talk about the fact that how can a farm worker be expected to live on 69 rand a day? When we just think about it, we know it's impossible, yet we expect that. That's what we expect and that's what we, the signal that we send to poor people. Because it's not an issue of the debate here. Nobody raises that as a telling point about what the challenges are of our nation. 
but it's those things that bring to bear the historical hostility between, for example, farmers and farm workers, between black and white in those communities. And because we're not finding solutions, that's translating into violence and tensions and the chaos that we've seen. So those are the real things that we must confront. But what this conversation throws up is how weak we are in how we're responding to that. Because in some respects, we're all leaders of our constituency. In the old days, there were leaders of street committees who would risk their lives to bring about the change of the undoing of apartheid. Today we hear that there are business leaders who won't even stand up and offend the minister because they feel strongly enough just about the right thing that must be said. We talk about political parties who sit here and don't offer one solution to how we can actually reorientate the economy to make sure that we bring about more job opportunities. How do we make an intervention to make sure we either beneficiate our raw materials, we put in place industrial strategies that ensure that job opportunities are created here rather than offshore on our raw materials. But that's the steps and the hard conversations that we must have. But when we get into those conversations, we must talk about the fundamental issues. And what is that? Take the raw materials as an example for what part of the conversation is. If we talk about what we do with the wealth of our country in respect of raw materials, we have two options. We can add value to it as part of making sure it has a national contribution, or we can give 25% of the shares of those companies to BE partners. Those are the two ways that you bring black people into the economy. Which did we choose? We choose the easier route to try and create a black elite to give legitimacy to really an undemocratic practice that came about as part of the historical legacy of apartheid. So we don't tackle the systemic issues that undermines our country's ability to deal with problems. All we do is we make sure that amongst the robber barons, we include some black robber barons so that the system can be said to be democratic. Now that's where we fail. And unless that discussion is held, the angry, unemployed, poor people in this country is not only going to worry about the white farm owners, they're going to look at both the black and the white farm mm. owners who are undermining their prospects. That's not just about criticizing. There was a great program on TV last night that should be public knowledge. There's a Solms farm in France who... What they've done, those owners on the farm, is that they bought another piece of land, they've taken their workers on as partners, and they probably have the best business model. Why doesn't that become a model for what everybody should do, so that the business practice on that farm is sustainable, they comply with so many corporate social responsibility impediments that many foreign countries would want us to see comply with to give us more market share, but that's not what we suggest. We don't suggest that as business. We don't talk about greater equity and a different business model. We try and take the business model that's shown us that we have so many unemployment today, such huge levels of inequality and such tensions between our people, and we try and just extend that into the future. There's got to be a new way. Now, I hear you, Tony, but I just want to stop you there. I mean, there, there are obviously two broad themes that run throughout the entire forum this evening. Right? There is the question, and I think Professor Turok put it nicely, there's a form and a substance issue. And I think you're right to highlight the fact that we didn't start with the substantive disagreements. How do you deal with inequality? How do you deal with a skewed distribution of the value that you extract from a certain sector of the economy? Um, you know, and, and those are important tension points. And I, and I do want to come back to them. I think they deserve a lot of um, intellectual energy to be spent on. But I, you have experience in using this mechanism. The question is, when you put a substantive viewpoint on these issues, like you've just done, why is there a breakdown in the process of dialogue at a place like NEDLAC? I mean, we do need to take stock of why is something that exists as a statutory mechanism unable to deliver processes that deliver conversation that, that plays out in the way that you'd like it to play out? If we look at the reality that confronts us, we know that we're having deepening tensions and greater social strife and our society is coming apart. We've got to respond to that. There's two ways that we can respond to that. We can fight each other or we can talk. I don't even think there should be an issue about quibbling on the form. We must talk and we must fix the institutional weaknesses that may exist. We all party to NEDLAC. Why aren't those criticisms brought there? Why aren't we fixing the institution if we think those are the weaknesses? What do you Part think the answer is to that question? Because we know if we fix the institution, we'll have to deal with the hard conversations about what the content is. And so it's easy to just talk past each other about the institutional form because we mm. don't actually want to talk about the content. Part of the content may be a discussion that talks about the tenets of the constitution and some of those things that don't deal with what it is we promised our people as a country and whether what we're doing now is sustainable. Mm. But 
But we've got to get to the point where we understand that when you're in leadership, you have an obligation, firstly, to be firm, to be honest, and to be forthright. And then when you're part of those engagements, you own that, and you must be part of making sure we fix it so that we can get to the real issues. Okay, and I want to get to those issues uh, presently. I think it's a fabulously provocative um, take on why we obsess about processes, because maybe we're scared at what tensions will come up dialogically if we talk about substantive issues like how do you deal with inequality, are you actually okay with some of the constitutional limitations to some policy proposals. I think that's spot on. But I want to get Dr. Herta in here because give us a sense, for example, in 2008 when you were able to avert uh, workers being laid off in Germany. Uh, obviously, there are inherent limitations with any comparative political analysis, but, but tell us a little bit from a process point of view, what is it that optimize dialogue between the different stakeholders in that kind of example? Very good question. But if you allow, I would like, like to do three remarks uh, before I answer your question. You see, it's interesting for me to listen to this discussion. Uh, not because, let's say, in my country, Marikana uh, didn't shatter everyone. It did. I think in an equal way as it did here, and I have to say that, uh, let's say, lots of people in Europe, they ask themselves, what are they doing with those lots of violent demonstrations? You see, we, of course, know about your historical burdens. No, uh, no doubt about that. And you can't define that away. And I don't. But on the other hand, it is really interesting uh, to see not only the differences of our uh, two, uh, both countries, meaning you have a huge unemployment rate, you have a big education problem, you have transformation problems, which we do, don't have, but we know what they mean. But on the other hand, it is very interesting listening to you all. In my country, this would foremost have been a question between business and labor. Labor meaning, let's say, unified and independent, so both not within, let's say, the relationship of the state or the ANC of politicians. Mm. Uh, this is what uh, I think is a very big difference. Secondly, I'd say uh, it is interesting because, uh, of course, we have come to, uh, let's say, uh, of an understanding that there are different interests of uh, employees and, of course, business. And there is a lot of conflict solution that has to take place. But on the other hand, it's not only that, but there are common interests between business and unions as well, meaning education. You see, what I mean is, uh, if, if you look back into the German history, it's not only the question of unified uh, labor force and making it independent, even from the Social Democratic Party, and we are of one ideological uh, route, I have to say that, but they founded and we founded common institutions for educating uh, workers. And this is what we need, let's say, to be able on both sides to find compromise and to do what the public in Germany expects. They expect that you put labor and business together, that they come to a solution. And if they don't, they ask people like me as mediators, and you can be sure that after eight days and nights, we find a solution. Because this is required. But uh, now let me say uh, where the state comes in. Of course, it's necessary uh, that uh, um, um, a government party and the government, they have to help with transformation. We had that in a very small extent after unification. And this cannot be solved, let's say, by labor and business. It's, it's impossible. This is a question, a task for politicians. Secondly, unemployment, subsidies, things like that, has to be granted by state, by government. And now I'm coming, sorry, back to the question of 2008. You see, we don't have net luck. In my country, we wouldn't introduce that because there is too much talking and too small a commitment. Uh, the interesting thing is that if there is a, a real problem, then uh, the government asks labor and business to one table. And there are very precise things that have to be discussed. 2008, it was the question, what about, let's say, laying off 
uh, workers. Mm. There was no interest, of course, not with the unions and no interest with business because we don't have an unemployment rate, but we have a problem of an older uh, getting society. So uh, they, both sides were interested in keeping as much of the labor force as possible. But the question was, the interest of labor was to better educate them. So they brought this in. So the finances of, uh, financing of that is a question. And of course, business brought in, what can we do if we keep the workforce in, uh, but we can't, let's say, uh, have them busy full time? So this is a financial question as well, and this has to be solved. And public expects that that can be solved. So now the interesting question deals with trust. Why do they succeed mostly? Despite or in spite, Germany has lots of labor conflicts. Today, in today's newspapers, it's the teachers and other public service people who are striking uh, on strike in several uh, of our regional states. And you will find that, uh, let's say, people, security people uh, at the airport of, of Düsseldorf or Cologne, they are on strike nevertheless. But uh, why, uh, let's say, was this uh, 2008 possible and why do they find compromises? Because they know each other. You see, the German system of participating, let's say, in workers' councils and on the, on the government board has, beyond all the problems for businesses or for unions, both don't like it too much, I have to say that, one advantage, they know each other. So they know quite well which one of business people is a monster and uh, who <laughs> is not. They know quite well uh, whether they have, let's say, on the labor side, a, a guy who well likes to be very full-mouthed and who is, let's say, uh, well able or capable to put hot shots back. So they know, uh, they know each other and they know quite well that respect and acknowledgement of different interests and uh, the, the respect and the knowledge that people expect solutions is that what has to prevail. And this, I think, is the reason for that. Uh, Dr. Price, I want you to react to that. I mean, obviously, that dissimilarity is the relationship here between the alliance partners make that kind of uh, distance between government and you know, labor and business near impossible, I would say. Uh, but certainly, when it comes to the very basics in argumentation between any two interlocutors, regardless of the conversation, a certain kind of basic respect, um, I mean, it sounds almost glib, but it is that fundamental as a precondition for dialogue to work. How might we achieve that between the stakeholders here? And I also want you to touch in the course of, of answering that on the example you gave me before the forum started where you said it's also important that we ask ourselves, are there success stories in relationships in South Africa like the CCMA, even if it's a limited example, where we might ask ourselves what works in the case where things do work? Well, a couple of points. Your, your first question was, have we moved farther apart? And, and certainly, and I'm not a, someone who studies the labor markets in depth, but as an almost lay observer, for, for six, seven years after 1994, we had a decline in the number of strikes. We had a decline in the number of uh, in, in violence in strikes. And it looked like it was working. Uh, since 2000, that's been reversed. We have now more days lost from strikes than ever before. And it's been a progressive trend. We have more violence in strikes than we've ever had before. In 1994, you had NEDLAC established, and for perhaps two years, it was uh, a body which, as the Act requires, policy was brought there. Uh, there was an attempt to negotiate these collectively. Now we've had the National, uh, the National Development Plan approved, not even presented mm. uh, to NED or, or hardly discussed in those fora. We have the National Development Plan interesting saying almost nothing about these relationships that we're talking about. Um, so it seems to me either people have lost confidence in that altogether and said that this isn't working. Why has that changed? I don't think we really know uh, the answers to these questions. And in some ways, my bottom line of the, of the forum is that we need a new, uh, some sort of commission. It is more talk and it is more research, but I think it would need a, a finite period. But I don't think we've got it right. And I think we have to start again. I think the uh, fact that we now at NEDLAC have business and, and labor sending their B and C teams uh, to attend. We have uh, government making decisions and policies which must involve the other parties but not using NEDLAC means that we've really got to rethink whether that's working and whether 
uh, a different model that is uh, more a model about parties that have power, that have to work together, as is being suggested in the, in the German model, it's labor and business. I think that's, that's one of the things we should be doing. The second area is one of the elephants in the room, I think, is, the, uh, is what has happened in, within the unions and the extent to which they actually represent workers. And, the, uh, and, and this isn't just a Marikana diagnosis. Uh, more than a decade ago, the September Commission, uh, by Kasatu, was already saying to Kasatu, union leaders are losing touch with the coalface. They, uh, they are being co-opted, or they are coming to represent different kinds of interests, don't really know what's going on. Our labor relations system depends at its core on union negotiators who know what their workers want and think. And if, if that becomes, uh, if they become divorced, the whole system collapses, it seems to me. So one of the, many fingers need to be pointed in many directions, but one of them is to say if we can't, uh, if we can't have union leaders who are, if we don't have strong unions, unions that are representative and democratic and where union leaders uh, represent the, the, the workers and where we know when we're negotiating with the union leader that we're also negotiating indirectly mm. with workers, then we don't have a, a system. So that, I think, is one of the interventions or, or where we need to go back to basics. The unions need to go back to basics. And I think not unrelated to that is this question, which I think you're hinting at, which is the alliance. Uh, I mean, the fact that most of this increase in days lost to strikes has been public sector unions um, and, and uh, who are negotiating with their party in the, with an alliance partner, both sides are incredibly compromised uh, in, this, in, that, in that struggle. Work, unions can't really fight uh, or deal without being accused of being sold out, of selling out, and government is compromised. So it seems to me that until we see a much more significant separation between Kasatu in particular, or union federations more generally, and, and, and the ruling party, and, uh, or the party in government, uh, we're not going to see significant uh, progress in the area of... I mean, ironically, this partnership bringing these three parties together depends on their being completely separate and independent, not being in bed together. And then the, the last point is that in, that in the original labor legislation of 1994, a key, there were three tiers. NEDLAC was the first, the bargaining chambers were the second, and then the third were the workplace fora. And in my view, those workplace four were, were key <coughs> elements of that, uh, of that system, partly because each workplace is unique, and especially the, the more human rights issues, not the dividing of the cake, the distributive issues, but the many other issues. And I think this relates to um, what uh, Dr. Heta was saying about building up trust, building up that personal connection, knowing who your workers are and who your managers are and and, and having those relationships on a regular, frequent basis, when it's all delegated to a central bargaining chamber and none of the people in the local industry or workplace are involved in that, you don't have any trust. Those workplace fora have not happened. There's something like 14 in the country. There should be 20,000. Mm. And we need to ask why that hasn't happened. In my view, well, again, all parties, but I think the unions have been uh, more... Uh, of an obstacle to that, because it, 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 it's, it's seen at face value as weakening the unions. Instead of having a sector-wide bargaining, you've got workplace bargaining, and that could be weakening them. In fact, in my view, if workers saw that the unions in the workplace were defending their interests and being successful there, it would strengthen the unions. But that's, that's not the reason why it should work. I think that uh, one of the next steps for us is to refocus on the opportunities that, that workplace bargaining for an op offer. Okay, I know both Ben and Michael want to get in here, but I'm just going to hit the pause button for a second and get some of the audience involved. Uh, please keep your comments as concise as possible. A question or a comment will we'll take one round. We'll have a second round, so don't panic if I don't get you. I just want to give them a little bit of breathing space, so it will be fairly random. Um, this gentleman over here. Just state your name and ask your question or make your comment. My name is... Uh, it's on. on. It is on. Uh, my name is Johan Marie, uh, and I have a, a comment uh, to the question of what is wrong with the relationship between government, state, and business. And just, for me, a big elephant in the room that was just mentioned at the last is the tripartite alliance that is really more powerful than NEDLAC is. 
and that it, it serves to undermine NEDLAC. And we've just seen, for instance, in the latest round of this enormous controversy over the, the proposed amendments to the labor legislation, that Casato has said that we've got some agreement in NEDLAC, but we're going to ANC as well to get the things we want that we can't get on NEDLAC. So that sort of fundamentally undermines the, 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 I, what I think is a very sound organization. Uh, I think Tony is right that it, the, the problems structurally need to be addressed, but NEDLAC must not be done away with. I think it should be given far more prominence. It was initially in the Department of Labor, and now it's administered by the Department of Economic Development, but it should be in the President's office to, to give it the clout that it deserves to have, because it is a forum at which we can, can build social partnership. And the problem with the tripartite alliance is that um, there are these three parties with enormous ideological differences between them. That's also reflected within the ANC, from extreme pro-capitalist to socialist Marxist on the other end. And, and how do you reach a broad consensus? And for me, the enormous value of the German model, which is, is co-determination, which when after the Second World War, the, the labor movement quickly recovered, demanded a say in the economy so that business would not cooperate with fascists again, fascist government again in future. And they wanted to say over the whole economy, but in the end it was a class compromise that, that business would give labor a real say in the workplace through, through workers' councils, which is the South African Workplace Forum is a copy of the works' councils. Uh, but they would have co-determination through works' councils and also by given, be given in large corporations, now widespread, equal representation so that the board of, uh, of directors is half share owners, shareholders, owners, half worker representatives. Um, so, so we can learn something from the German model, um, but the, the, the problem with the, with the tripartite alliance, with the Communist Party and the Kasatu leadership, all Marxists as well, is for them, it's, there's no question of class compromise. We are still struggling for the socialist liberation. So how does one build an ultimate consensus? Uh, on, on what to do about business and how okay, to take South to Africa forward behind. together. Thank you. Okay, please keep it pithy unless you are married to a politician. <laughs> <laughs> right at the back, gentleman in red. Yeah. Hi, um, it's Hopo here. I think what I found interesting uh, was the issue of this lack of trust between business, government, and labor. And um, how then do you... Assuming that um, a representative of government or the ANC was invited to this forum, and um, how do you then begin to um, tackle or forge the issue of trust when, for example, a representative of government of the ANC is not uh, at the forum? And perhaps maybe if they were invited and they declined for some reason or another, how do you even begin to, um, to sort of um, forge that relationship when one party is not coming to, to, to the table? Thanks. Yeah, um, despite sometimes being Chaturach, Professor Ben remains a member of the ANC, eh? <laughs> and a member of Parliament, might I add, as well. Um, also, this not being an SABC forum, it's not compulsory to have government here. <laughs> Over there, yeah. My name's Michael Rates. The real elephant in the room is Section 32 of the Labor Relations Act, which takes away, for practical purposes, the right of the unemployed to sell their labor into the formal sector. For those who are not familiar with Section 32, it is the mechanism in the Labor Relations Act which is used to compulsory extend wage agreements reached out in bargaining councils and covers probably most sectors of the economy and particularly those sectors where we would be hoping to absorb our labor force. Um, if you happen to be unfortunate enough and, and unskilled enough not to justify the minimum wages which are imposed through Section 32, as an unemployed person, you are effectively disallowed by law from selling your labor at a price where you're in, into the formal sector, that is, at a price where you have a chance of getting a job. You're left to scrabble as best you can in the informal sector or become a criminal or depend on the charity of others. 
Section 32 breaches several of the provisions of the Bill of Rights of our Constitution, the right to freedom of association, the, fright, the right to fair labor practice, the right to follow the trade or occupation of your choice, and the right to human dignity. There are a few lesser ones there, but those are the main ones. So we in South Africa continually wring our hands about our inability to deal with our labor problem, and yet we have legislation in place which takes away the right of unemployed people to sell their labor into the formal sector, which is where we want them to sell their labor, where they will be protected by other aspects of labor, desirable aspects of labor legislation. Um, and then we wonder why we have 7 million unemployed people. And anybody who, who takes issue with what I'm saying is quite welcome to offer the, the minimum wage to 5 to 7 million of our unemployed compatriots. I'm sure they'll be very happy to hear from you. But they won't. They won't hear from you. Now, <laughs> you know, if there are other aspects of labor legislation which make life more difficult for employers, but this is an absolute barrier to the unemployed. And Mr. Ehrenreich, instead of asking, well, you may well ask how somebody survives on 69 rands a day, but I would like to hear him explain to me how the unemployed, who are not allowed to sell their labor, exist on no rands a day. Okay, can we leave it there in front? Yes. Thanks. Just a quickie. No, no, sorry. Uh, your quickie will come. I pointed to the gentleman in front. I want a, a generational mix, if you will. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My name is Luntu Sokutu. I'm a student here. Uh, I would just want to refine or uh, ratify the, the question in saying that um, the rift between business uh, or government, uh, international business and labor, because I don't think there's any business in South Africa. But anyway, I, I just want to highlight, you know, that the problems with the, uh, the problem with the societal contradictions in South Africa is that none of uh, you in that panel or your generation will inherit uh, the consequences of what is existing today. It's us, the youth, and the more instead of you know making jokes about critical debates like these, you know narrowing a debate such, so important to who, how one speaks well and throwing around stats, you might as well just take a nuclear nuclear arms and destroy and, and, and extend our generation. And I, and I mean it, it's not a joke. But I want to say the only, the only way which I think will, will destroy, and not even mend, will destroy the, the, the rift between business gov international business government and labor is uh, the destruction of the capitalist system. And I'm not going to go into the debate about how socialism has failed in other countries, etc. Because until you, 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 you destroy economic blockades, release the Cuban Five, allow a, a plain level playing field according to all countries, then we'll speak about which system is uh, uh, better suited. Um, but, but lastly, I just want to say that any relationship is based on two things which I think are important, which is cooperativeness and compromise. I want to ask to the entire panel about what, comprom what, what cooperativeness has business shown since 94, but most importantly, what has business in South Africa compromised with regards to this relationship? And I think it would be ironic, I mean, to grandstand about national strikes while and not speak about the numerous strikes that take place here at UCT. Thanks. <laughs> can, can I just go to the back there? We'll have the quickie, and then we'll take one last question there for this round. Yes. Thanks. I'm Paul Hoffman from the Institute for Accountability. I'd like to hear the panel, especially the South Africans on the panel, on the topic of the unemployable among our unemployed. I'm talking about people with matric certificates who are not functionally literate. I'm talking about graduates who do not have the soft skills to hold down jobs for graduates. It's an increasing number and it needs to be addressed, I suggest, mm. through the education system being reformed. Thank you, Paul. And then the lady over there, yes. Good evening, my name is Rumbi Chendaopeni and I just had a comment. It might be wishful thinking, but I just want to know what the panel thinks. 
Um, I think that government should stop thinking about themselves as a separate entity to labor and not just as a lawmaking and enforcing entity. They should start thinking about themselves as empowered laborers with the responsibility of empowering the other laborers, kind of like top management in an entity. And that might put them into a mindset where they will, um, that will benefit both business and laborers. And maybe then wages and productivity will increase and the violent strikes in working days last will decrease. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In the interest of time, I'm going to present an intellectual challenge to my panelists. You can respond to any of the comments or questions you wish when you next speak. But I would also like us to introduce a part of the conversation that Tony foregrounded and which I know Michael vigorously wanted to get into, which I think is an important direction in which to, to move the conversation in the last 20 minutes in general, which of course is the question around the so-called elephant in the room. We've spoken a lot about processes, and I'll start with you, Michael. But of course, what Tony was saying I think is probably true, that it's easy to talk about processes because there's nothing emotional, there's nothing difficult about problem-solving processes. It's, a, it's, it's intellectual conversation. But the real question is, are we not intractably disagreeing on substantive issues, such as was highlighted by one gentleman, and I saw vigorous disagreement in head shaking <coughs> over here, you know, when we have to make uncomfortable trade-offs between closing the income gap and dealing with unemployment. Maybe that's even a false choice, but that's often one of the issues that, that, that we don't speak about, that a potential implication, depending on your analysis of what the empirical consequence will be, of closing the income gap might be policy choices that will inadvertently leave the unemployment problem where it is, which is why some people are asking, what, what Tony, do you have to say to someone who's unemployed while fighting for better wages for someone who is currently on the lower rung of the working ladder? Um, and so my general question, starting with you, Michael, is do you think that on the substantive issues, setting aside processes, <clears throat> that there's a possibility of finding each other, or are there intractable disagreements on some of these questions that Tony foregrounded? Well, I think the debate tonight has illustrated that there are indeed some pretty fundamental divides and some pretty fundamental basic assumptions that differ between the parties. There are also the structural challenges that we've heard about. Um, Max indicated one of them in terms of the alliance. I think that's a structural difficulty that makes it much more difficult to, to reach these agreements. But it's not impossible. Firstly, I do think that... Um, Although I've been around the trust track, if I can put it that way, for 20 years, uh, and it is vaguely dispiriting to find oneself pretty well where we started, we have to continue to make a deliberate effort to avoid caricatures, to avoid the way that we fall into the trap of thinking too easily, government just a bunch of incompetence, business a bunch of illegitimate sort of robber barons, labor only interested in themselves. And I think those little bubbles float and above people's heads, even if they aren't articulated. So according the parties to this debate, dignity and respect requires an effort, and it requires us to overcome all our prejudices from the past. Um, I think the illustration of just how difficult it is is that we've just spent three years in NEDLAC talking about the wage subsidy, uh, almost three years, and we have brought forth a mouse um, and this is the trouble with corporatist bodies, is that in the end you fall back on the lowest common uh, factor or denominator. I always forget, I'm not a mathematician. But you reach a very watered down a con consensus that ne doesn't really get to grips with the problem at all. I think it's really symptomatic of the, the fundamental nature of the problem that we have only mentioned once, I think, <coughs> Paul Hoffman, education. Education is uh, such a fundamental issue, and it's a medium to long-term answer to this. We can't talk about any of these issues without dealing with education. Uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, again, I'm sorry to say I'll ignore the, <clears throat> the socialist uh, fantasy, but we <laughs> have to think about the global environment and issues of productivity and competitiveness. We ignore those at our peril. Uh, Professor Chirok, I mean, you were very keen for us to get at some point this evening to discussing the substantive <coughs> issues. Um, what do you think the prospects are for, for resolving them? I mean, if we take inequality as an example, 
we, we tend to focus a lot on poverty and unemployment in South Africa, and then we add inequality in the rest of the sentence quite glibly. But I think part of the reason we do so, again, going back to Tony, is because if we isolate it, we might come to uncomfortable disagreements. There's a moral question there, not even an economic question, about how one distributes value that you extract out of your different sectors in the economy. We've never had a conversation in South Africa around the ethical question of the value of labor. I'm not talking about what the market thinks it is in rand value. I'm talking about ethically whether markets are even blind to economic justice considerations. Do you think if we had that conversation explicitly, there would be prospects of getting somewhere? Let me recommend a piece of reading. Price Waterhouse Coopers, one of the big international accounting firms, has published a report recently on mining. And they give a table of returns of, of salaries, uh, of returns to the executive in the mining industry. The executives across the mining industry, excepting Anglo-American and BHP Billiton, they're not included, but all the other mines are included. Why they left those two out, I don't know, but uh, all the other mines, there are 39 mining companies in the survey. And they tell us that the executives last year got increases of 8%, which is well above the inflation rate. And the, that excludes bonuses and share uh, dividends. So <clears throat> this is the arena in which Marikana happened, in which you get huge poverty among mining workers, who, by the way, have extended families. You know, a worker is not a single individual. I think Tony should have emphasized that, and I'm sure, I'm sure he will when he comes there. And a worker is not an individual who has his own or her own cost of living to take account of. In South Africa, they have eight people who are subsistence, who are dependent on them. So when you look at a report like that, and you say to yourself, trust, uh, glue, it's very difficult. In a mining industry where you have this huge differential, between the executive pay and the workers' pay, you want to have glue. Well, of course, we want to negotiate some out. We need to. We absolutely have to find a way forward. Absolutely, I agree and totally. But we have to recognize that South Africa has a history, which is what I said before, has a history of huge inequalities, huge coercion of the labor force, where the value of labor was never... Uh, taken into account, you know, uh, going back to Adam Smith and uh, uh, the, the, the value of labor as part of uh, the whole industrialization process. This is not talked about in South Africa. South African labor doesn't have a value. They, they can be, according to the labor relations regime that people want, you'd hire and fire at will. <laughs> These are people with families in the rural areas and so on. Dependents. So, you know, I, I think that why so many protests? Uh, and indeed, we are in the ANC and in government, we are deeply concerned about the extent of the protests and the violence which is accompanying them. But you have to ask the question, why? And my answer would be that we are doing so little, we're not doing enough to rectify the awful disparities that we inherited. I'm not one of the people who says blame everything on apartheid. No, because we do make mistakes, as I said earlier, even now. And we're not doing enough in certain areas. But the disparities are indeed historical. The mine workers of South Africa went on strike in 1915. I'm talking about African mine workers. White mine workers went on strike in 1922. The, the African mine workers went on strike in 1946. Huge strikes. And now they're striking again. Now, under our government. So why? Is this because of the glue is falling apart? Because we are not managing the rainbow business? I don't think so. We're not managing to engineer a fair society. That's what we're not doing. And it seems to me that all this business about trust and negotiations must start by saying, let us overcome the historical inequities uh, and, and, and let's discuss them in a serious way. I, I must say, I, I have something to do with business and also labor and, of course, with the, uh, the government. There are ways of overcoming the differences and the trust. 
It can happen. I've been, if I may just uh, anecdotally say, I'm involved in discussions around the mining industry, beneficiation, all that. And we have put together conferences where business, the, very, the mining companies are there, government is there, the agencies are there, labor is there, <laughs> academics are there, politicians, uh, intellectuals are there, and there's no tension. There's no tension. Because we focus on a very clear program of, of, of beneficiating and making use of South African minerals for the benefit of the country. By the way, the manufacturing circle, which represents the majority of big manufacturing industry in South Africa, is more than happy to sit down and discuss because they themselves are subject to some of the difficulties that we, we are creating ourselves as government. So, you know, I think it is possible. I agree with Mike entirely. But uh, we have to define the project I rather liked what you said about government saying to business and labor, here is a clear issue, a clear demarcation of interests. Now, we want you, business and labor, to sort that out in a very practical way, in a very clear agenda, and, and let's not have uh, the whole business of trust coming in as if, as if there's, that is the problem. The problem is negotiating real differences and real separate interests. And I think that's the way to go forward. Okay. So I think the panel could agree. And I think we yeah. should all agree. Well, I want to bring in here Dr. Price. I mean, Professor, I, I, I fully respect what you're saying, and I think everyone share your sentiment. And a key determinant of whether we can achieve that is, of course, whether there's sufficient will between interlocutors to try and arrive at a mutually beneficial set of solutions. I think that's absolutely the case. But Dr. Price, surely, I mean, I'm still not satisfied with both Michael and uh, Ben's responses, because the, the bottom line is, if we talked about the hard uh, content issues, uh, we will have intractable disagreement. Tony will have a tough time convincing us that we need to reduce income inequality while simultaneously working on employment. Someone will say to him, he's being callous about people who don't have any job at all. And the question is, on those very specific issues, what are the prospects of uh, there being some sort of mutually acceptable outcome on, on that debate. They're interested. Why don't you go first? Yeah. No, it's interesting that you, uh, let's say, keep, let's say, to this question. Because, uh, you see, there are different ideologies. There is, let's say, a big difference, let's say, in his vision of society and in mine. And I think it is, uh, it is possible to respect that very openly. If he talks about socialist fantasies and laughs a bit, I would tell him to this environment of a fair society which I want to have globally, and not only for South Africa, of course for you, but for us as well, because we don't have it. We don't live, let's say, in some sort of a fantasy. Uh, well, belongs to this environment, belongs the poverty on the, on the globe. To that uh, belongs, of course, that, that what Ben said, that the rich person gets richer. And uh, even in my country, the wages of the workers are going down relatively. Mm -hmm. And it belongs, of course, to that, that the states in Europe have to have billions to solve banks. And on the other hand, we don't have the money, that's what the conservatives say, yeah, to move up, let's say, in the minimum wages. So this belongs to the environment as well. But now is the question, who can deal with that? And I said, you see, you have to accept that these are the political questions you have to deal in the political environment. But if you have, let's say, a social and a labor conflict, the first thing must be that those who are involved directly start talking together what is possible, why is it possible, why do they give this guy in the management more, why don't they use the money they are making, let's say, in the mining industry to improve the living condition, the education, and the wages of the workers? This has to be, let's say, disputed nevertheless. And in spite of acknowledging that there are totally different ideologies. You see, uh, if you don't do that, that would be the thinking which we have in Europe. You won't improve anything. And why I, we wouldn't like, as, and I have been a politician for 37 years, as you know, why we wouldn't like politics to be involved too much is because if you do that, then you involve, let's say, uh, let's say uh, the government, you have the danger that they are, let's say, losing face. 
uh, they have the trouble, let's say, either they don't get the support of business or what should they do, let's say, with the vote of labor. These are really crucial, crucial questions. And that's why, uh, let's say, we have decided after lots of strikes, mm. bitter strikes, bitter defeats, let's say, to say, okay, wages and working conditions is prevailingly the question of labor and business. And if they need... And if we feel as socialists or other as conservatives, we should discuss the ideology. We'll do that in the political in the political. Okay, we're, we're running out of time. I do want to give three more panelists a chance to, to make contributions. I want to start with you, Dr. Price, though. I mean, am I being unduly sceptical? Because what Herta is saying to me in the South African context couldn't happen that easily because the stakeholders to that dialogue have very hardened ideological positions. Uh, it's not yeah. even clear that their starting point is that the alternatives around the table are both coherent and compelling. I think they do have different positions, but perhaps what I think is a crisis uh, is the, also the opportunity. I mean, in, in many respects, public companies are driven entirely by their shareholders' needs. And to persuade your tens of thousands of shareholders in the stock market that actually profit shouldn't be the most important mm -hmm. concern but living conditions of workers... Uh, is a much bigger problem than simply the trust relationship between the manager who's negotiating across the table from the union. There are external and other factors. To persuade the, the union and management may think that a, a minimum wage that is higher than the current 69 rand is acceptable, but if they also recognize that, with respect, with no, no ill respect to my namesake, Mr. Price is going to go and buy its clothes directly. <laughs> From, from China rather than from a local manufacturer because it is available more cheaply and they can't restrict that mm. sort of access. Those are all sorts of external realities which I think also clearly determine this. And it seems to me, though, that shareholders and workers will start understanding that they have to negotiate when they start recognizing that the alternative is so explosive sure. and that they all lose in the long run. And I think that's the situation we're in at the moment. I think we've reached a point of um, labor dissatisfaction and business dissatisfaction and shareholder concerns and uncertainty that actually creates the space for us to say, we, we're in this country and we're in this economic future together. We have to find another way through. It sounds like a very macabre motivation to start Un listening for the first time. Unfortunately, stuff. but I th yeah. Okay. Yeah. Serge, I want to give you a chance here because just, just in two minutes, I know we need a longer conversation around especially what your party makes of it because it's often very easy to critique some of the responses that we get, especially from Kosatu, and to say we've got a massive unemployment problem here, 40% up to 60, 70 in a certain age categories. But of course the bottom line is that you guys have shied away from exactly these tough ethical questions. It's one thing to say I am wanting to introduce a certain wage subsidy, for example, in order to absorb some of the unemployed young people into the scheme, but you haven't dealt with the very deep economic justice uh, challenge of inequality, for example. I mean, inequality hardly features in some of your guys' rhetoric. So do you think that if we had those conversations in a very hard and blunt way on the substantive issues, that there are prospects for a meeting of the minds? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I think uh, just to correct the situation. We have a, the program, the RD2D thing. It's about redress, you know, all those things, those things that you say we haven't touched on. But the point for me, which is very, very important, is this. And this goes to the heart of the discussion here. The questions that were asked, what about Section 32? What about the destruction of the capitalistic system? What about the issue of um, 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 unemployed people? the education of those things. All of those things are asking the question to us here. How do we actually get a consensus that this is what we need to do about the high number of unemployable people? And we would say education, good quality education. It's got to be there because otherwise people have no negotiating uh, power if they don't do that. And the issue of a netlek kind of organization and I'm one of those people who says NEDLEC should be given a chance. I don't believe that we should destroy it. I believe that we need to go into NEDLEC and, and, and do a few things with it. This is the important issue about how, how do you deal with something like Section 32? You can't deal with it arbitrarily. You've got to get the agreement of all of those people who are key stakeholders so that you can agree. The challenge, and it's really the challenge confronting this panel here today, and I hope we can take it further, 
is to say, how do we start building this sense of common purpose? Like when we have an issue. Let's take the issue of education. We have education today. The social partners come together and they go into a huddle. They agree and the agreement is carried out. How do we get that? Because that's where we are lacking. Tony, not often in the lines that you have the final say, so this is your chance. <laughs> An unanswerable last comment. But particularly, I want you to focus on those substantive issues because you don't let discussion about processes get in the way of you speaking your mind on the substantive issues. What do you think the prospects are for a dialectic on those issues ending in mutual agreement? Well, the fact that we're here and we're talking about it means we at least have an appreciation of the gravity of the problem and that we've got to find a way out. But the one thing that that must tell us is that we can't continue with business as usual. Yeah. Now, we accept we can't have business as usual. What are the changes that we make? Yeah. There's a conversation to be held about the changes because sometimes <coughs> the statements that you make about the changes is even more insulting than swearing at someone's mother. Because if you say that the person, the father earning 69 rand a month a day and he must now earn 50 rand a day, which means that his children are going to starve tonight in his family or somebody else is going to take his job and he'll have no employment, that's an act of disrespect to workers. Now, we've got to see that about each other. We have to understand that because we have to build trust, but it's got to be a different appreciation. When people look at what happens in this country, the majority of people who work, whether they work on building sites or in the, in the homes of other people, they see the extravagance in our society. They see the huge excesses in our society. They see the gaps between the rich and the poor. And that, added to the historical hostility of apartheid, puts us on a powder keg that we have to deal with. The questions that I think we talk past completely, when we look at the history of the labor market reforms that happened in South Africa, if you just give me one minute, when they brought in, in place, for example, labor broking, all that happened with labor broking is the worker who had a job with medical aid and pension and a decent wage, then lost that job and he went to work for the labor broker at half his salary, no medical aid, no pension, and no housing subsidy. And the income into that family was less, the income into that community was less, and you just had a zero-sum game. This is the issue about the assumptions. One of our assumptions is that if we bring about more equality in our society, people have more disposable income, that in itself will generate demand and that will get our economy to grow on a different trajectory. Now that's very different from somebody who says just pay them less wages because it's not going to do anything to inequality. But you see, it's those approaches that we have to change. And then I think that there are issues that we must talk about because it goes to some substance, but it has its origins in form. Listening to the speakers here today, I think they're making fundamental mistakes on how they're positing what the Labor Relations Act says. For example, workplace forums. The reason we don't have workplace forums in many workplaces is because you have shop stewards council operating there and they carry out the same function as a workplace forum. The only difference is, is that people who are non-members don't come into the forum. That's the only difference. Go look at the prescripts of the law. But what we end up saying here is that the reason it's not working is because that doesn't exist. So what I'd want to suggest is that we understand we've got to talk, but I don't think we grapple with the hard things and so we skirt around even just our assumptions which are incorrect sometimes about what the form issues are. We've got to talk about inequality, we've got to talk about poverty, we've got to talk about the regulation. What happened with the collusion around bread prices, around chicken pieces, around the stadiums that were built, millions of rands were stolen, and nothing's going to happen to those guilty parties. We don't hear government say, or business saying that we've got to deal with those instances that takes away the credibility and legitimacy of the system. So sure, the shareholders have an interest in what companies does, but so does the society in whose broader interest they should also be acting. And it's those moral issues that we better find our way to soon, otherwise we're all going to be in trouble. Thanks. Thank you. It's exactly 8 o'clock. I'm sure the German partners will be happy with the timing of this event. <laughs> From my side, I want to just thank all of you for coming this evening. This is a very difficult conversation. At the heart of it lies the challenge of economic justice. And as Professor Duroc said, in many ways, we, we were anxious in the early 90s about political stability, and perhaps we underinvested intellectually and politically in the tough economic justice debate that we need to have. And I think our panelists did amazingly well both to engage each other at a high level about what the right kind of narrative is that we should try and aim at in search of economic justice, but also 
dipping into some of the specificities now and then. And obviously, it's an ongoing conversation. And the next level, really, would be a series of conversations that then pick out each one of these substantive topics that have come out in the second half of the conversation and then drilling down into them. So uh, I think we can give our panelists uh, another round of applause for their contribution. Um, I almost said, and finally, my favorite editor, but I now write for another newspaper. So one of my favorite editors in the country, Nick Dawes from the Mail and Guardian, just to make some final remarks. You used to be my favorite columnist as well. <laughs> ich hätte Sie gerne auf, so auf Deutsch bedankt, aber my German really won't hold up to um, having this conversation in German for very long. Um, but, um, Ambassador, thank you very much uh, for helping us to, to host this discussion this evening. I must say, I was a bit worried. We have quite a lot of people on the panel, um, and it's a hugely uh, tough set of issues. And I was concerned that we would have a bit of a mishmash of a conversation and not um, uh, get down to those issues at all. But I think the combination of uh, local contributors who have a clear and important and well-informed set of views on these things, um, and then some triangulation, uh, if you like, um, from Professor Dobler Gmelin and, and, uh, and, and Max Price was, was really helpful. And, and Eusebius, thank you for drawing it out so delicately and, and all of you for contributing. Um, we, are in a, we are in a really difficult moment, and in a sense, a moment where I think the political capital that we thought would let us get away with uh, a very slow path of remediation, a very slow path of fixing all those inequalities that Tony has referred to has, has effectively run out, because uh, the gaps that people see are much wider than the faith that they're still able to hold um, um, in, the, in the politics of the past. Uh, so it's an absolutely urgent discussion uh, how we find the space at this at this moment um, to, to to have a resolution that will enable us to make genuine progress. So thank you all for helping us to to start the conversation, hopefully in a different direction. Thank you to UCT again, um, uh, to the German Embassy, and to all of you, um, and, and and to you guys for coming along uh, to be part of the discussion. And we'll see you in the pages of the Mail and Guardian. Thank you.